Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar by the Global Antibiotic Research and Development Partnership, GARDP, an innovative public health approach to counter AMR. I'm delighted that we have uh, four uh, individuals as panellists and before we do that, we're going to start with a video that will highlight some of GARDP's recent achievements. Moving on from that, Manika Balasegaram, the Executive Director of GARDP, will give a short presentation on the plans and strategy for the next few years for GARDP. We will then move on to a question answer panel session in which you can all answer questions. So the questions that you can ask us, please do this by using the menu on the right hand side of your screen as shown here. Please type your question in and I'll do my best to ask as many as I can during the webinar. Please note if your question is for a specific panellist, please put their name first. Thank you. So we will now move to show you a video. I'm sure you'll all agree that was a, a lovely short video, but our achievements in the last few years are really quite impressive and we're so pleased with them. So now I'd like to introduce the Executive Director of GARP, uh, Dr. Manika Balasegaram, who's going to outline our plans for the next few years. Thank you, Manika. Thank you very much, uh, Laura. I hope you can all hear me clearly. Um, Good day, everybody, and I'm just going to give you a very quick run through of our um, 
God P strategy for 2024 and 2028. And um, you can find much more details in our in our website where we've actually put the strategy on. But I'm just going to give a, a very quick um, preview um, of what we're planning to do in the next few years. Um, so just a bit of background. I, I think you all know this. This is the data from the global burden of disease that came out in, in early 2022. Uh, and obviously, I think the surprising, but perhaps not so surprising news is that indeed AMI is um, really responsible for um, quite a significant amount of deaths and associated with a lot more. And this is a number that's projected to rise. Uh, and indeed, I think what we are really facing here is um, two uh, intertwined problems, a market and a public health failure. There's been quite a lot, I think, um, excellent work that's really discussing the market failure around lack of commercial incentives and limited and uneven investment. Um, but we'd like to also kind of highlight a bit more about the public health failure. Um, that is, of course, linked to the first problem, a lack of new antibiotic treatments targeting priority pathogens, new antibiotics that are not widely registered, particularly in high burden countries and not widely available there, shortages both of old and newer antibiotics, uh, and lack of specific treatment options for certain key populations, uh, particularly the children for us. Uh, and um, amongst that, I think for us, GARP, we've been an organization that was set up back in 2016. Um, this is uh, really our coming to our third business plan. Um, and what we are really now focusing here uh, now is really looking at a public health driven approach. Uh, and GARP's model that we've really kind of developed over the last years is three key, three pillars. Um, first of all, an integrated R&D access approach. Secondly, collaboration and licensing agreements. And third, uh, equal partnerships. And all three are extremely important in the work that we are doing. So um, just to talk, uh, make a mention first a little bit about what we mean by an integrated R&D and access approach. This is something that we talk about in our, in our strategy document. Um, we are largely focused around clinical development and then late stage development to access. Um, our work is really framed around licensing and collaboration agreements that allows us to identify partners, including sub-licensing partners that can manufacture and commercialize um, the products that we are um, working on uh, with partners, uh, but also looking at aspects around formulation, development, manufacturing, distribution, and importantly, what market shaping interventions we need to look at. And then when we look more at the R&D and access considerations, both in product se selection and development, um, this means that we are involved in clinical trials, uh, evidence generation for optimal use, regulatory uh, strategies, particularly for high burden countries, uh, and um, additional aspects such as pediatric development. Uh, and towards the end of this, we are really also working to support global implementation and stewardship with a network of partners. So uh, talking a little bit about our collaboration and licensing agreements, um, we negotiate collaboration and licensing agreements with, with pharmaceutical companies and biotech companies of varying sizes uh, in exchange for expertise and financial support and the networks uh, that we can bring in. We seek the rights to manufacture and distribute these treatments in hard hit regions. Uh, and of course, we're not a, we're not a pharmaceutical company. We're, we're a nonprofit organization. So what we do is to aim to sub-license these rights to manufacturers for registration and distribution to facilitate access. And clearly, there are certain aspects and conditions that we have to look at in the details uh, of this. But this is a schematic really showing um, how this works um, in terms of our approach. Nothing, nothing particularly surprising, but we feel a very important and key part to the work that we do. Uh, and last but not least about partnerships, um, we are a public-private partnership. Our approach involves working with uh, not just um, with companies around the world and, and manufacturing partners around the world, but also experts uh, in many low and middle income countries uh, and key stakeholders, uh, including in government uh, and in research institutions. And our aim is to really work with partners to coordinate efforts in the antibiotic pipeline and in specific projects. Uh, and we often, uh, we, we try to bring a range of skills, financial support, scientific resources, uh, as well as that geographical reach uh, into projects. Um, and of course, um, that expertise comes way beyond GARP, it comes through all our are different partners contributing to our uh, projects. So a little bit about where we are today. Um, so, so for some of you who are familiar with our previous business, our, our previous uh, strategy, um, we really talked about um, five by 25. And 
um, here's the progress that we have to date. So we, we, are, we are making good progress in the 5 five by 25 You can see various different projects here covering different programs uh, in our portfolio. Um, th this covers two um, um, new chemical entities that have finished phase three trials. Uh, another project where we, we have sub, uh, taken in a license from uh, a, a large company for a registered new drug. Um, uh, a, a big project we're doing around developing new empiric treatments for neonatal sepsis. Uh, and we hope to be launching um, a new project before um, in 2024 to really uh, look at new, a new treatment option for uh, serious bacterial infections uh, and sepsis. Um, and we hope to be continue making this progress uh, in this next phase of our business plan from 24 to 28. And I'd like to pause and just spend a minute on this slide because um, it's important to understand that for GARD-P, we've always had three different ways of how we look at um, our prioritization and our portfolio. One is obviously on the WHO priority pathogens, but the others, this is around priority disease and infections. Uh, and the third uh, is really around key populations. And through this schematic, we've really developed um, two key disease areas in our disease area strategies, serious bacterial infection, sepsis, and STIs. And within that specific uh, infection types, ranging from uh, infections you've typically seen uh, um, in, in, often in hospital settings, for instance, but also specific um, uh, conditions like neonatal sepsis, um, this covers the priority pathogens, similarly uh, as it is for STIs, and we have developed a, a range of different um, treatments in our portfolio to address these issues. Um, you can see in, in the blue and, and light and dark green, these are projects that are ongoing, uh, and what we hope to have in the gray parts are new treatments that we need to um, kind of uh, bring in in our portfolio uh, in this coming um, um, uh, strategy period from 24 to 28. Um, now, all of this, of course, is going to cost us resources, uh, and I think this, this slide is really just showing um, what we have spent to date um, and what we uh, will be planning to, to look at uh, to spend and uh, to deliver this strategy, um, the resources required uh, over the next five years. Um, and we believe our funding need is going to be around 220 million um, euros. Um, we have uh, raised a, already a portion of this funding. Uh, and are act actively now securing and trying to secure uh, additional funding um, for this period. Um, but we feel this is extremely important to deliver the current projects as well as um, new projects that we may um, bring into our portfolio. And in terms of the breakdown of this funding, as you can see, the vast majority of that's really falling in the clinical development part. So covering our three programs around serious bacterial infections and sepsis, neonatal sepsis and STIs. Uh, and also a significant part around um, moving from development into specifically access work. And so that's where the lion's share of our, of our um, investment is, is going into uh, for our, our coming strategy. Um, now, of course, what we hope to do in the coming period is to um, continue developing these five new treatments and uh, by, the, by 2028 uh, facilitate initial access to three treatments. Um, we hope to begin developing at least one new treatment in our, in our portfolio and uh, launch further critical partnerships um, in terms of developing this and de delivering this integrated R&D uh, and access approach. Uh, and, you know, obviously we can only do this um, with partners uh, across the world. And so um, really a call out to all of you out there, um, our existing partners and we hope future partners that um, really make our model feasible and, and practical and, and something that can deliver success in the future. Uh, and finally, I'd like to really finish by really saying that all our work is made possible with the essential support from um, our key funding partners. So a big thank you to all of those partners who have really supported us over the years and have really made all our work possible and have really been critical in delivering um, you know, the successes that we're starting to deliver today. So. Thank you all very much, and thank you all for joining this webinar today. Thank you very much, Manika. So we will now move to the question and answer session with our panelists. And I'm very pleased to welcome Angela Jamofsky, who is from Tigerberg Hospital in South Africa, Ramanan Laxminayaran, who is the chair of the GARP board, 
Veronica von Messling, who is from the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research, and Jasper Klaassen, who is from the Department of Pharmaceutical Affairs in the Dutch Ministry. So I would like to welcome all of you uh, into the panel discussion now. Please join me. Thank you. Uh, just for our audience, I think we may be having difficulty with one of our panelists joining us, uh, Veronica van Messing, but I hope she will be able to join us during this discussion. So thank you everyone for joining. Um, and just a brief reminder to everybody uh, in the audience to ask your questions in the panel on the right-hand side of your screen. Please type them there and I'll do my best to ask as many as possible. Um, if you have a question for a specific person, please put their name at the beginning of the question. So thank you. So uh, I have a first question for Angela. So Angela, why is it important to carry out clinical trials in countries with a high burden of infection and indeed of drug resistance? Thanks, Laura. Good afternoon to everybody. So thank you for that question. I would argue it's not important. It is essential to conduct these trials in high burden settings. And high burden settings for the problem of antimicrobial resistance really boils down to sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia. And that is where the burden of AMR infection is located, but also where the impact of these infections is most acutely felt. And at the same time where the resources available to treat and manage patients with these infections are most limited. Um, speaking just from a, a burden and numbers perspective, by 2050, about three quarters of babies born in the world will be being born in Africa and Asia. And um, so the problem in these regions is going to grow. Uh, putting my pediatric hat on, thinking about overcrowded maternity obstetric units in healthcare facilities where infection control is challenged and knowing the diversity and the burden of gram negative antibiotic resistant infections in these centers those three factors really are a recipe for disaster. We already know from a population perspective that neonates are the population most burdened and most likely to die from antibiotic resistant infections. And so I would argue doing trials in countries affected and neonatal units affected by AMR is essential. Thinking specifically to African populations, I mean, they are the most genetically diverse globally. And so if you're wanting to test new therapies, new antibiotic or antimicrobial treatments, it would make a lot of sense to, to test them in African populations. Um, we know also that regulators, uh, country approvers, as well as access is also enhanced by conducting clinical trials in the regions where you aim to use those drugs. Clinicians also in those facilities and regions will have better uh, understanding uh, and uh, exposure to those antimicrobials through conduct of clinical trials. And in my experience, clinical trials and areas where they're conducted also help to drive quality improvement and overall better awareness of AMR and new products in the, the AMR and treatment pipeline. So in a nutshell, it is essential to conduct trials for AMR in Africa, Southeast Asia, and other high burden areas. Over. Thank you, Angela. Very thorough answer, so excellent, thank you. So Ramanan, um, what would you say is GARDP's added value when it comes to developing new treatments for these high burden drug resistant infections? Uh, Raman, and I'm really sorry, we can't hear you at the moment. Oh, sorry, I had my mute on. Uh, thank you, Laura. Um, you should be able to hear me now. Uh, and uh, thanks for that question. I think Carton plays an essential role here. As Manika had explained in his introduction, there is a challenge with antibiotic markets in that new drugs are typically developed in high income countries, uh, and increasingly the cost of these drugs is extremely high. Uh, because that's what it takes to bring the drugs 
to market. Many of the companies don't succeed because the markets to sell those drugs don't exist. And the patient population in need, as Angela just pointed out, are not in those countries. Those patients are actually in LMICs, in low and middle income countries. So we're trying to solve a problem in the wrong place with the wrong strategy when we do it in the current way, which is antibiotics that cost five, 10, 15, $20,000 each, which I'm not making this up. This is what new antibiotics now cost. And then trying to figure out how to make them accessible to patient populations where they could afford a $10 antibiotic, but certainly not a $20,000 antibiotic. Now, how does GARP do this? GARP basically exchanges risk. So it de-risks companies at critical stages of clinical drug development, especially phase two, phase three trials, in exchange for having the market access rights in low and middle income countries. Now this works for pharmaceutical companies because they have difficulty raising capital and to get non-dilutive capital. In other words, GARP does not take shares in those companies. It simply provides the money and provides the technical expertise for the conduct of these trials and enables them to complete it. And in exchange, it takes away from the company something that is not even that valuable to them, which is market access in many poorer countries where they would normally not even go and register the drug. Again, we've seen now that companies don't register their drugs outside of high income countries for the most part. So this is a trade off that doesn't diminish the value of a startup working in, in antibiotics, but adds a lot of value for them. Now for the world, it makes a lot of a difference because now instead of a company trying to sell as much antibiotic as possible in a developing country, you now have a nonprofit which is in charge of those sales which means that the nonprofit profit mm -hmm. has really no incentive to oversell the drug. GARP doesn't have to make any profits. GARP is fully incentivized to make sure that stewardship is appropriate and that people have access, but they have appropriate access. They have access when they really need it. So in that sense, the GARP model, which has evolved over time, but started with this original vision, is indispensable. And I would go as far as saying that in the phase of clinical development, uh, it could be Guard P, it could be another entity which does the same thing, but this is the model that will work. Uh, and I'm happy to discuss why Guard P, you know, is also important, like other product development partnerships in that it dramatically reduces the price, the cost of drug development beyond what pharma can do on their own for a few simple reasons. First, the main cost of pharma drug development is really the opportunity cost of capital. Now, Guard P gets it's money from public funds, as you'll hear from Veronica next. And, you know, a venture capitalist may need a 10x return in the next five years. You know, the government of Germany or Japan is not looking for that kind of financial return. So that lowers the cost of the drug. Number two, GARP is able to leverage government institutions in many countries like Japan or Germany, or sorry, in, in South Africa or Thailand to conduct clinical trials at a fraction of the cost that would cost a private pharma company. That's a really important way of lowering the cost. The third thing is that, you know, uh, I, I think, you know, GARP does very well in terms of, of leveraging a whole bunch of other networks and, you know, common trial platforms and so forth, which can also be helpful in lowering the, the, the cost of, of development. And fourth, you have to remember that pharma companies will often cut off a project because it doesn't achieve a commercial benchmark. GARP has no commercial benchmark, but GARP only has a public health benchmark. And therefore, when you cut off, don't, you don't cut off projects just because of commercial success possibilities, you actually lower the cost of drug development. But happy to, to, to chat more about this, but I think this is, a, you know, this is an answer that covers a lot of the aspects of the question that you asked. Thank you. Thank you, Ramanan. Um, I'm really sorry we seem to have continued to lose Veronica, so I'm going to move on to Yasfa. Um, the Netherlands, like several other countries, have been supporters of our work uh, so far and continue to be so. So um, what aspect of the GARPI business model is so attractive to funders such as the Netherlands? Yeah, thank you, Laura. And uh, first of all, let me congratulate GARP with uh, this, uh, let's call it an anniversary in the launch of their new five-year five -year strategy. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, we have been uh, a funder and a partner for GARP since its inception. And uh, 
we're really happy to see with the milestones that have been achieved so far. Uh, so to answer your question, um, so we really encourage novel business models that enable the development of new medicines that address areas of high unmet medical need, but that also really focus on both access uh, and fair and reasonable prices. Uh, and we believe Guard P is an excellent example of an organization that uses both new and creative approaches to deliver real value, but that, that also really makes a difference for a lot of people in the world. Uh, and, and maybe to illustrate uh, the success of Guard P in, um, in developing this new business model, I was recently asked by a representative of the Dutch innovative pharmaceutical industry how Guard P managed to deliver clinical results for its new gonorrhea drug at, at such low cost. They really went into the books and looked at, you know, like the, the budgets that were involved. Uh, and they were really surprised because industry often claims that, you know, much higher amounts of funding are required to deliver this type of clinical development. And, and I think these type of comments are, are really a compliment for Guard P's business model and show that it's uh, that it's working. Uh, so this is one of the reasons why we're very happy to support Guard P. Thank you. Um, Andrew, I'd like to move back to you with a question now. Um, excuse me, I'm, I've got questions coming left and right, so I'm just going to look at this. So in terms of conducting trials specifically on babies, such as you've been involved as a principal investigator, what did you feel was the added value of Guard P in uh, entering this area? Yeah, expanding on what Ramanan said, I think Guard P as a non-profit really has some critical issues at heart, uh, which plague us in low middle income countries, and that is access. I mean, even a drug like penicillin, which is absolutely essential to treat congenital syphilis and syphilis in pregnant women, is now largely unavailable right now in most African countries. Um, and taking the standpoint that these are essential drugs which should be available for appropriate use, as Ramanan points out. The same may become true of antibiotic resistant infections. In fact, currently in most African countries, there are daily stockouts of essential antibiotics, meaning that treatable conditions like neonatal sepsis uh, are often fatal simply owing to a lack of access to the right antibiotic to treat them. Some of these issues can be sorted out by local production, by access, by registering the drugs in the countries that need them, and as Ramanan points out, making sure they are available at an affordable cost. And um, These are all essential elements. Um, and I really feel that more sort of investigator-led trials, led by local clinicians, in these high burden countries are also important for acceptance and market entry for new products. Um, clinicians are, are very uh, reliant on guidelines, but we know unfortunately that the 50 year old WHO guideline that recommends empiric treatment for neonatal sepsis with ampicillin and gentamicin is no longer effective in many, many neonatal units in Africa and Asia. Um, but we need evidence-based guidelines with evidence generated from these low middle income countries and particularly neonatal units uh, to inform clinicians, to change treatment and to convince governments and ministries of health that they cannot rely on these drugs any longer and need to register and make available improved treatments for antibiotic resistant infections in newborns and children. Thank you, Angela. So um, I have a question that I'd like Manika to um, address, if that would be possible. Manika, can you turn your camera back on, please? Great, thank you. So um, th this question's come from, uh, it's a really interesting one. So following up on Jasper's comment about low cost, um, can you speak a bit more about how you use the funding received by GARP in a targeted fashion to keep the cost low? and to incentivize manufacturers and distributors. So creating a sustainable supply of treatments. Yeah, I mean, first of all, uh, just make, want to make the point that of course, you know, we work in partnerships, so we're, we, we're not kind of doing all the work ourselves. Um, obviously being a nonprofit, there are various factors that come into play, also some advantages that we can pull on, uh, you know, that, that maybe makes a difference in terms of things like, you know, how much would it cost to work with 
uh, you know, specific consultants, getting non-profit rates, um, you know, having a, a good strong network of academics. The fact that both our private sector partners and our public sector partners and academic partners all bring in something as well. So that, that I think changes the metric of our course uh, as well. So there's that, that means that there's a lot of, I would say, we would call it in-kind contribution, but they're real contributions. It's, it's personnel time. It's sometimes, you know, taking on certain responsibilities. So all of this make, makes a difference, I think. Um, but ultimately what it's really about is allowing us to use public money as effectively as possible and making it stretch as far as possible. But I actually think the most important aspect is really around the priority setting, identifying you know, the projects that make the most sense at the clinical stage, and then actually then formulating the right kind of partnerships with both you know, for-profit and, and non-profit organizations that makes the most difference. It's the framework of those partnerships um, that are absolutely essential that I was talking about in my presentation that is, that is key. Thank you, Manika. Picking up on that, Ramanan, um, do you feel that uh, public-private partnerships such as GuardP will end up in five or six years time being one of the most significant ways forward for funding research and uh, going into access of new treatments? Um, and this is based on a, a question which I'm slightly rewording for a, an audience member. The fact that the global economic crisis by, is considered by this person to impact AMR more and more, and this may uh, disincentivize uh, the commercial sector more to exit this space. So, Laura, that's actually a, you know, it's a complicated question because there are many things influencing, uh, you know, decisions by people who invest in this space. A very important thing is the rising interest rates. So uh, when interest rates are going up, uh, the cost of borrowing capital, especially for risky projects and development of antibiotics is always risky, is going to be much higher. So people are going to want a much higher return, which the antibiotic sector is simply not going to be able to provide. And that itself means that we're going to have to think of a slightly different model. Now, we have a range of models to think about. If you look at malaria, almost every malaria drug, almost every malaria drug right up to Coartem was developed by Walter Reed in partnership with pharmaceutical companies. The private sector has a very important role to play, but that role, may not necessarily be in bringing all the cash to the table to be able to pay for antibiotic development. We've already seen that in the last three, four years with GARP, with CARBEX, with, you know, with a lot of BARDA investment in the US, which is basically putting public funds into companies to be able to develop antibiotics, not in exchange for a financial return, but in exchange for a public health return. So if you define public-private partnerships as public fund engagement to be able to get the public health outcomes we want, I think that offers a model, not just for antibiotics, but potentially for anything in pharmaceuticals. Because at the end of the day, we don't want drugs to be developed for a profit motive as the primary endpoint. We do want profitability, no question, because that's how you know, companies can survive. But the lens of what gets developed should really be about what serves the public need. And while someone in the antibiotic space may want to develop something that provides a public health benefit, if there's no money there, they simply can't get into that business because you know they have to borrow the money to do this. So that's where the public-private partnership plays a really important role. And I dare say that this is something that is going to be extremely helpful to the private sector going forward. And now that they know that a model of working with an entity like GARP exists, the way in which they will approach their choice of drug, the market they're serving, all of this is going to change, I think, over the next few years because their metric for success is now different when they're being de risked in the way that they're able to right now. So it, it's a slightly involved answer, but I, but I do think that we are definitely not going back to that old model of development, which is entirely private sector. It just, it just can't uh, survive anymore. Thank you. Let's have a, a question for Jasper. Um, the WHO developed the 
a global action plan to address AMR and that led to countries to develop their own uh, national action plans and strategies. So how do GARDP's uh, global activities tie in with the Dutch national strategy? Uh, yeah, thank you, Laura. So, so two things. So, currently, we're drafting a new national action plan uh, with the Netherlands. So, we we hope to uh, to make that public uh, sometime in the near future. Uh, but to maybe uh, sort of lift the veil a little bit already um, and to give some insight. So, we we do believe that in order to combat AMR, we should take a global approach. Uh, the world these days is, of course, interconnected, and we've all seen this during the COVID pandemic. Uh, but also for us in the Netherlands, when analyzing resistant bacterial strains that appear in our healthcare system via either travelers or, or migrants. Uh, and, and this is something that we see more and more. So we, we cannot restrict ourselves in, in thinking that we, uh, as the Netherlands, as a single single country, uh, can tackle AMR in isolation. Uh, and, and in addition to that, uh, we believe that global warming and climate change uh, will also introduce uh, more broadly infectious diseases to, to Europe and the Netherlands that we were not used to seeing previously, yeah, that were not endemic uh, in this geographical part of the world. Uh, so in our policies, uh, that may be national policies, uh, we have to prepare for this new reality and, and take a much more global approach. Uh, so uh, to that extent, uh, focusing on organizations like GARDP fits into our national strategy, even though GARDP takes a more global, uh, global access uh, approach. Thank you. Uh, moving back to you, Ramanan, um, this is again quite a complicated question, but I'll do my best. <laughs> um, it, th this uh, audience uh, member has just indicated that they've heard people talking about the challenges in advancing research and development due to unharmonized regulatory requirements. What do you think could be done, um, and including by GARP? to uh, overcome these challenges? You know, I think Malika should really take that question because he's dealing with it. I'll just say, you know, from a, from a, you know, from a very general response to that question will be that the lack of regulatory harmonization, which is in some ways easier said than done, is a barrier to registering drugs uh, in many territories where there are patients in need. So this is not really an action point for Guard P. It's really an action for the point for the World Health Organization, uh, for actually countries like Netherlands that are actually working with many countries to help on regulatory harmonization as well. Um, and so it, it, it is an agenda that transcends antibiotics. Antibiotics is not the reason to do this. There are many reasons to do this. But I, I, I think maybe Monica should answer that question in more detail than I can. Yeah, I, I, the, it, this is a very big question, but maybe I can get, try and simplify my answer by giving an example. Um, I do think a lot of progress has been made on the regulatory side in terms of giving some guidance and clarity and trying to make it feasible to conduct trials to develop new antibiotics. That, that's on the one hand. On the other hand, where you can see an impact on why we need more harmonization is do we have one standard way where we can do a simplified pathway to develop you know, treatments for newborn babies and young children? Okay, as, as identified by Angela as kind of the priority population in the world. That's not so, that's not such a clear cut answer to, to put on the table. And that may result in significant cost and time taken to actually do that development. And therein lies the issue on where we need to look at aspects of how we can look at regulatory harmonization to give some clarity and a standard pathway where we can say, okay, this will cut it in, should cut it for most regulators around the world. And, you know, I, I, maybe it might be naive saying this, but I, I mean, I saw how these kind of discussions happened during Ebola, for instance, where, you know, countries and WHO got together to have these discussions. And I do wonder whether there can be ways of how we can encourage more discussions and how we, we do look at development for, for antibiotics. And then there's a lot of, I think, you know, counter questions on saying, you know, real regulatory barriers might be, you know, should be tightened up or are non-inferiority trials sufficient, all of this. Don't want to go down that rabbit hole, except to say, having been an organization that's been involved in developing antibiotics, it is really difficult to actually develop and conduct these kind of trials for a treat for treatments that may have relatively small, you know, 
patient populations that are accessible to clinical trials when you talk about drug resistance. On the flip side of the coin, there may be populations like newborns where you may have a large population, but it's quite complex to do these trials. So there are a lot of different challenges that need to be overcome. Some are regulatory, some are more about how we conduct and do these trials in the networks we use in the countries we go into and the experts we use. So they're, they're, these are not completely unrelated issues, but I hope I've at least partially answered your question. And I do think that if something is seen as a big enough public health problem, there should be some efforts made to think about having, you know, looking at this harmonization aspect. Thank you, Manika. And I have a question for Angela, which sort of picks up on this a little. Um, you were one of the principal investigators involved in the observational uh, study that GARP carried out with uh, numerous sites uh, across 11 countries. What would you say uh, was the most challenging aspect of that for you? And what was the most interesting finding? Thanks, Laura. So it was a very exciting study to be part of. It is the largest study to date of sepsis in hospitalized newborns globally, uh, enrolled around 3,200 children, as you said, in 11 different countries. Um, I think you hinted to some of the complexities, Monica, of conducting clinical trials in the neonatal population. I mean, this is an incredibly vulnerable population understandably parents are extremely risk averse uh, to signing their child up for a new or untested drug um, and when we come to them these are not well healthy newborns these are babies with sepsis in some parts of africa 50 percent of babies who are diagnosed with sepsis die uh, what we found in the observational study is if a baby had culture positive sepsis one in five died in the study and those who had culture negative sepsis, so no pathogen identified, 10% died. Um, so I think one of the hardest parts of running the study, even though it was observational, was approaching and speaking to parents at an incredibly difficult time. That should be a joyous time for any parent, but when your child is critically ill. And as an investigator, we are asking you to put your faith in us uh, to hold your child's life in our hands and study new treatments which are urgently needed. I think fortunately in Africa we have a concept of Ubuntu um, where everybody's health is, is important and we, we work for each other's benefit. Um, and I think a lot of parents are willing to be prepared and to put their faith in treatments as they see the need. Everybody knows someone who has died of a bacterial infection. Um, so it's clear there is a huge need, but I think running trials in populations with high mortality and incredibly vulnerable populations is a challenge. And then some of the most interesting findings, actually, I think it was even a surprise to me across all the study sites, there were more than 200 different antibiotic treatments prescribed by physicians. Um, and that really speaks to the complexity of treating newborns, both to access what is actually available in your hospital pharmacy and also due to the lack of uh, appropriate guidelines because of antibiotic resistance we've had to diverge for a long time from WHO recommended treatments of ampicillin and gentamicin which has led to a diversity a complexity and a confusion in treatment of neonatal sepsis globally. The other thing that I think was an important take home message was that one in eight babies, 15% had been prescribed a, a antibiotic of last resort. So really in all of these settings, AMR was a real problem that affected a large proportion of babies being treated for sepsis. Thanks. Thank you, Angela. So um, we've had several questions in um, touching upon various aspects of tackling AMR um, from IPC to stewardship and, and this question really captures several of those so this is for you Manika. Um, by introducing new treatments and making them accessible um, what are the guidelines or measures that guard people hope to uh, use to maintain the potency of these new treatments for as long as possible? Yes um... 
that that's all that's a that's a fairly long question to answer again but um maybe i can just touch on a few things and give some examples the first is obviously we can discuss with our partners um various strategies that we can employ and and it can work from from you know a perspective of saying okay this is where we're going to focus the development of this drug which which is what we did particularly for Z the case of zoliflorazin where we you know agreed with our with our um, partner at the time in taste was to say, you know, the focus is going to be on, on Neisseria gonorrhea. So from the phase one trials that were done, this was going to be largely focused on more of an STI treatment. We haven't looked at expanding, you know, use in, in any other indications. We've really now want to deliver this as a, as a kind of dedicated STI drug. And that's important because you suddenly start looking at a much smaller population of where this is going to be delivered, um, you know, from, from a starting point. Then I think there are various aspects that we have to do, not just in the regulatory part, but what we call kind of evidence generation for use. So we have to look just not just beyond the regulatory trials. You know, once the drug is registered, we have to do additional studies that that look around, you know, looking at specific um, key populations, uh, for instance. And we've talked about this already. There are various aspects of work that we have to do, particularly if we're working at drugs that we will have to manufacture with certain partners. Uh, and here we have to look at standards that have be, are being developed and, and apply them in the agreements and contracts that we may have with manufacturing partners, particularly around things like environmental uh, um, standards, uh, as an example. Um, and then I think if we are looking at sub-licensing uh, and, and commercial partners um, for our territories, um, particularly in, in, uh, in the kind of territories that GAPI typically gets, then we have to talk about you know what kind of um, uh, you know things that we would need to look at in those contracts to to say okay how should these products be marketed what should be done or what shouldn't be done as well um, and I think this is important but will be much more complicated there there are precedents for that in in slightly different models for instance how how the medicines patent pool for instance have looked at certain treatments but antibiotics are, I think are much more complicated um, um, issue than say a, you know antiretrovirals or even Hep C drugs, and I think we do have our work cut out for us. We have no illusion about that. But I would also add that it's very, very important at the end of the day, and probably the most important aspect is to work with partners at country level, because they are the ones who are really the ones who are going to lead on this. It's not us in an organization based in Geneva or whatever that's, that, that is, can, can have all the answers. We can do certain things as an organization taking a global perspective. At the end of the day, it's engaging with ministries of health, engaging with regulators, engaging with key opinion leaders in countries that will make a critical difference in ensuring how this treatment is used. And they are the ones that can often influence and have a major impact. And I think we should not forget those people you know, at country level that are the leaders in their own country and can take a leadership role and should be implicated and involved and it's why we advocate strongly that they should be implicated and involved in the development of these new drugs, because that is the best way how you will develop champions and, and partners who can really then understand what needs to be done next and have some degree of ownership uh, and time to develop their ideas and put them, put them into place. I, I would end by saying that I think much more needs to, could be done through national action plans, but countries are going to need some support in their national action plans to make them work. Um, this will need financing, and of course, where that financing comes from um, is, a, is another question, but something that I think is really important to look at. Thank you. Ramanan, um, in terms of uh, facilitating access in different parts of the world um, to new antibiotics, there are many models out there um, in terms of procurement, advanced market commitments, which do you think is going to be the most appropriate for GARP to use? And how, you know, the, do you think that is a way forward for other organizations too? So before we get to even pool procurement, the first step is product registration. Most antibiotics, as Monica explained in his introduction, are not even registered in countries. So you know, we're talking about something down the road when the first step is to get that registration done. Now, companies will not necessarily register drugs in small countries where the market is likely to be quite small. So one of the things that DART will have to think about is how to work with partners through regulatory harmonization, through the kind of influence that WHO can have to make sure that the drugs can actually first enter the country 
in a wide range of countries where patients are in need. That's the very first step. Second is, of course, to figure out a stewardship model that, that does not impede access. We want stewardship, but stewardship cannot be an excuse for not getting antibiotics, say in rural areas where they are absolutely needed and perhaps more than even in, in urban, urban settings. So that's the second step. Then comes to the issue of the financing, which then food procurement is certainly an option. But you have to remember that a very important aspect of Garthi's model already hardwires this need for accessibility in the price point. If you can think about, if you automatically, if you're lowering the cost of the drug at the outset for development, you've made the drug more accessible because it's more affordable. The other aspect is to think carefully about the cost of manufacture in terms of the number of synthetic steps, the way in which you're formulating your molecules, uh, so that you and what your raw materials are, what your starting steps are. Now, to a pharmaceutical company, these are not deal breakers because if you are, you know, making a drug for thirty or forty dollars, if you're going to sell it for, you know, the vast majority of what goes into their calculus for pricing is really not the cost of manufacture. It's the cost of having developed the drug and the cost of the capital for developing the drug. Now, if you don't have to worry about that, which we don't because we have the license to do it in many countries, then immediately the cost of manufacture becomes the largest component of our cost getting into a country. And then it's important for GARP to think about those steps at the very outset or alongside the company to make sure that manufacture actually gets to be you know, quite reasonable and affordable, all of which then reduces the burden for any kind of development assistance program. You could take your pick, like the Global Fund or uh, you know, uh, you know, if you think of HIV drugs for PEPFAR or whatever it is, whether bilateral or multilateral, the lift then for that last financing step becomes much lower if we've done all this hard work, you know, in advance itself. So uh, I think access is many things, and uh, we've got to think about it in a in a comprehensive way, and not just about the money, which I think is not even the most important. Thank you, uh, Ramanan. So uh, moving on then, I'm going to put a couple of questions together again, and this is really for you, Manika. Um, considering the success of the Zolli trial and the work you've been doing on other uh, areas, whether to lay the groundwork for clinical trials or looking at other new treatment options and developing those, what would you say uh, that is the way that we would uh, go forward in looking at new treatments. So and specifically, are you going to consider supporting new STI infectives, anti-infectives, and those for the serious bacterial infection space, or have, is your portfolio full? Um, well, I, to give a very clear answer, it depends how much money we can raise in the coming, in the coming five years. I mean, obviously our priority is to deliver on a current portfolio. I'll make that super clear because we, we have tangible treatments we feel that can make a huge difference to people around the world. And we need to kind of deliver these through partners, um, or, you know, particularly targeting, I think, high burden countries, but beyond that in, in due course. Um, but of course we are, as you've seen in the presentation, I did, we, we are and have left the space open to expand um, partnerships over the coming five years, and of course, it, it, it doesn't mean that they'll start from day one of January the 1st, 2024. It, it, it will be over a, a five-year period. Particularly, uh, I think there's one area in, in covering crime nexus, which is um, a serious bacteria infections that we, we want to cover. Um, we want to make sure that we, we keep working in the pediatric and neonatal space. Um, but I, of course, in the SDR space, the, the key question will be to aspect will be to continue the development and access of Zolli, but we have of course kept the space open to look at at, at, at um, um, potential new projects in the SDR space and what we have to do, we, we will discuss with partners, including with WHO and, and, and key, key opinion leaders to, to get a better um, handle on, on kind of next steps there, but it's, it's definitely in our configuration of, of our new business plan. So in, in effect, I would say, you know, there's no radical new thing we're doing here. It is really about 
um, consolidating the portfolio and having a rounded portfolio that's going to allow us to deliver what we perceive as the key public health um, challenges and gaps and, and, and problems that need to be filled uh, in the space and taking this integrated R&D access approach and working with partners and utilizing things like licensing agreements to expand access uh, beyond just doing the, the science and the, and, and the studies. Thank you, Manika. I'm noting that time is moving on and we're going to have to start wrapping up this webinar. So I'd like to ask each of you to just very shortly, 30 seconds maximum, just to give your final thoughts, starting with you at Jasper. <laughs> I was hoping you would end with me. <laughs> no, uh, I, uh, I, I think my final thoughts are that uh, I, I think as a as a funder, uh, we've been very much impressed with uh, the way you've tackled this. Uh, I've already alluded to uh, how much we're uh, appreciative of the business model, uh, the way that you engage uh, not only with us as a funder but also with different levels of of the Dutch ecosystem. And so I feel there's like a real connection there between uh, what we offer in our country and the organization, but with really this global scope. And we're very happy that you make your own decisions and strategy with, you know, focusing on which diseases and, and access. So we really applaud your efforts and we look forward to encouraging uh, you to move on and to extend our partnership uh, towards the future for another five years. Thank you. So Angela, uh, your last words, please. 30 seconds. I would like to say on behalf of uh, people of Africa and maybe our cousins in Asia, we often feel very neglected and often the last to receive the benefits of science and all the miraculous treatments that are becoming available. But I would specifically like to thank God P, all the funders, industry and governments and ministries for really putting Africa, Asia and other AMR burden settings front and center stage um, and I think after a very long time I have hope and I can see the pipeline I can see development on the horizon but I think access and pricing and stewardship are going to be the things that we need to really focus on to great the greatest benefit from new treatments as they become available thank you thank you Angela and Ramanan, your last words, please. Well, I would encourage people on the webinar to uh, very closely read Garpi's strategy. Uh, you have to remember that everything that Monica spoke about has been accomplished for just about $120 million, which in the grand scheme of things is so little money compared to having you know, had Seth Derek call, you know, ready to get out into a number of countries, Zoli Florissant, phase three uh, trials done, uh, Seth Green, Daniel Bo back then, which has also been successful. So I think this is a, a real testament to the success of the very dedicated and capable team at Guard P. And uh, I think another thing to remember is that all these folks working at Guard P could be working, you know, in other sectors in private pharma, they're making you know, a lot more money. They're all here for a social mission. And you have to remember that that social mission, which drives a very talented team, you know, is what really takes this to a level way beyond what just an organization can do. And of course, as has been mentioned many times, it's Guard P is just, is, you know, the P part of the Guard P is the critical part. It is a partnership. And all of this is enabled by many governments, many funders, many partners, all you know working in the same direction so I, I think this is the way in which drug development really can happen and uh, you know, I'm really delighted to have been part of this journey and uh, and look forward to seeing what unfolds ahead. Thank you Ramanan. So it leaves me now just to thank everybody for joining us today and I hope that you'll be able to join us uh, in a few weeks time for a revived webinar at uh, one of our technical webinars so uh, i hope you've enjoyed the last hour with us i certainly have found it very stimulating and thank you to all the panelists thank you and goodbye thank you bye-bye